Hello everybody and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Last time we got things rolling in Windows where we set up our build environment. In the interest of getting things rolling on Linux, we are going to do the same type of setup here just for Linux. So this should actually go relatively quick. There's just some more steps than on the Windows side, but all things considered, it's not too bad. Before I begin, I would like to give a shout out to the channel's first partner. The partner is the highest tier of membership on the channel, and that partner is Arslia. I hope I pronounced that correct. Thank you very much for supporting the channel. I would also like to give a quick thank you to the other supporters of the channel who are up on the screen now. Thank you very much. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you would like to support the channel, you can do so by clicking the join button down below. Details on memberships are actually available in the video I will post here. There will also be a link in the description below. First thing we're gonna to wanna to do is go back to the Lunergy uh, Vulkan page, which is uh, vulkan.lunergy.com slash SDK slash home. Uh, this uh, is where we will find the uh, install that we wanna use. Now, we have a couple of options here for Linux. Uh, we have the SDK tarball, we have Ubuntu packages, which basically allows us to select a version of Ubuntu that we're using and install it using the package manager that way. And then we have other Linux information here. So I am currently running on Ubuntu 2004. You guys are likely using something different, but uh, I'm going to walk through this process on Ubuntu. Uh, if you guys are running Arch or something like that, you're kinda on your own, but Something tells me that if you guys are running Linux in the first place, most of these concepts will be familiar to you already. So I'm going to roll with the SDK tarball option and simply download the latest SDK from here. Now I've already done this on my machine, so I'm basically gonna walk through the process. So basically you'll want to download this tarball file and somewhere on your machine, you'll want to uh, go ahead and expand that. So in my case, I actually have done this on the home folder into Vulkan. So this is actually where my Vulkan and SDK sits on this machine. Uh, I would recommend you guys do the same thing. So uh, once you have expanded that, um, you'll want to go to this documentation page that they have here. I'll drop a link to this in the description below so that you guys have it available. Uh, but this basically indicates all these steps that we would need to take in order to um, install the, the, the Vulkan SDK properly on our machine. This install the SDK portion here, download the SDK, install it. This is the one that I used. I did not use the, the Ubuntu version of this um, just because I prefer to have my folder in the user folder versus elsewhere. So you'll want to create the uh, Vulkan folder there. Uh, and this is where you extract the tarball. Of course, this will be different um, for you guys as far as what version you're using, but this is where you're gonna wanna do that. And then uh, after you are done with that, you'll basically wind up with a version folder like this. Um, so in my case, it's 1.2.1621. And when you click into that, uh, you will actually have something in here called setupenv.sh. So I'm just gonna right click this and open it in terminal and you will want to type source and then setup env.sh and you'll want to run that. And that'll run this um, shell script. I'm not going to do that because I've already done it here on this machine, but basically this will put environment variables that you will need going forward. The next thing that you're going to want to make sure that you do is you're going to want to make sure that you have Clang installed. Again, if you're using Linux, I'm sure you guys know how to install Clang, so I'm not going to actually walk through that process. Okay, so just to verify that our setup is correct, we'll type clang here. And we should get this clang error, no input files. Uh, that tells us that clang is installed. And then uh, we'll also wanna make sure that uh, echoing Vulkan SDK actually gives us a directory, which in this case is the, uh, the home folder Vulkan version number x86. Uh, 64. So again, if you don't have that, you'll just want to run source and then this setup environment um, sh file. Now that we know that all of that is created correctly, we can now switch gears a little bit. So I'm going to close this terminal and I'm going to get rid of this browser window. And I'm going to hit Control-Alt-T to open a new terminal. 
and then I'll CD uh, into a development folder that I've already created. And then from here, I'm going to say git clone, and then I'm going to put in this URL, which is github.com slash Travis Roman slash Kohi. And that will go ahead and clone it. And then I can CD into that. And if I LS that, we'll see that we have everything that we need there. Okay, so before we can move on, there are a couple of other things that we will need to have installed. So we want to make sure to run uh, sudo apt-get or just apt-install. Uh, and this, of course, is for Debian-based uh, distributions. If it's Arch, you want to go ahead and use Pacman instead. But the packages we want are libx11 dev, libxkb common x11 dev. These packages are going to be required for our windowing setup, and we want to go ahead and get those things installed now. now I already have these installed, so uh, I'm not going to go ahead and reinstall them because there's no point in doing that. But just make sure that you have these installed uh, as well. Another thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go ahead and grab VS Code. Now, in Ubuntu, they have this software center that you can use to actually grab VS Code. You can search here and just say um, VS Code, and you can search for that, and it'll eventually come up. Uh, or you can uh, go ahead and install it from the terminal. Uh, again, if you guys are using Linux, I assume you know how to install that. So uh, I'm not going to walk through that here. So Within our newly created Kohi folder, we are going to want to go ahead and type in code space dot. And that is going to launch Visual Studio Code in this folder. So we can see here that we have Visual Studio Code uh, opened in our uh, newly cloned repository here. So we have our, um, our setup that we created for Windows, and now we're going to create the Linux half of that. So um, this is actually going to be relatively simple because we've done actually all the VS Code configuration that we're going to need to do already. Um, but I will go back over that really quickly just to uh, sort of solidify some of those concepts. Under Engine, we want to create a new file. And we're going to call it this time build.sh. Uh, and this is just a bash script file. And so in that, uh, I'm just going to paste some code. And let me go ahead and maximize this. And so uh, basically here, uh, we are making the bin directory if it does not already exist, which it doesn't. Here is the bash equivalent of what we did the batch file to get all of the names of the C files. Assembly is called engine. We have all of our flags here like before. Um, in this case, we have a lot more stuff that we need to link to in order to actually uh, make this, th this thing work the way that it should. So we are linking with the, Vul um, I'm sorry, we are including the source and uh, Vulkan SDK include folders as we did on Windows. And then we also, uh, for our linker flags, we are linking with um, Vulkan XCB, which is sort of the windowing system, X11, which is the uh, X server or the X window system, uh, X11 uh, XCB, um, which is the um, sort of translation between these two. X11 sits on top of XCB, if I remember correctly, and there's actually something that we're gonna have to use for this in order to actually uh, handle keyboard input. We'll get to that later. And then we also want uh, XCB common. And then we're gonna add the Vulkan SDK's lib directory to the linking folders, as well as the X11 R6 uh, lib folder uh, in order to link properly with X11, because these things aren't provided by default. And then in terms of defines, we're defining underscore debug and uh, k export. Okay, and then uh, this basically looks exactly like it does on Windows, where we pass the file names, compiler flags, we're outputting our assembly. This time it is called a SO, so this is the Linux equivalent of a DLL. Um, it's a shared object. Um, so you note that we're using shared up here, that's where that terminology comes from. Uh, and then we also have uh, our defines, include flags, and linker flags. And that is all there is to the engine build file. Now the testbed build file is going to be the same thing. So it's going to be a file called build.sh. And we'll go ahead and paste in some code here as well. This looks almost identical to the other file. The only difference is we're applying a couple more things. So we are... Um, Adding to the linker flags, uh, we're linking with the bin directory that will be created up here once we build the engine. Uh, and then we're linking to our engine library. 
And then this WLR path here, what this does is actually, um, this gives us a, um, a path during runtime to actually load our, um, our linked binaries, right? Windows by default searches in uh, the current working directory for linked binaries, like whenever you're loading a DLL or something like that, but Linux doesn't work that way um, by default. And so we actually need to add this R path um, uh, comma dot after this WL here uh, in order to tell the, the linker to say, you know, when this is running, look in the local folder uh, for any linked libraries that we're using as well as anything else that's defined in Linux. Uh, and that will allow us to have the SO file and the executable file right next to each other and it'll know how to actually find the SO file. Uh, and then of course the assembly here uh, in, in Linux, typically programs don't have like an executable or a .exe extension, they're just, they are what they are. And so that is all there is to build SH uh, in, in those two contexts. Uh, there is also a build all sh file that we need to create. So in the base folder, I'm going to right click, say new file, build all sh. And again, I'm going to paste in some code. This basically does the bash equivalent to what we did in the batch file where it pushes into uh, the engine directory, runs the build uh, script, and then pops out of that and then checks the error level to see, hey, did we have any errors? And if so, it aborts the script and the same thing for testbed. Not a whole lot of craziness there. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna have to do really quickly is uh, I'm gonna open up a new terminal here and it uh, looks like my font might be messed up. So under my settings, I am actually going to, I'm going to remove this terminal integrated font family, which should fix that, okay? Now what we're gonna need to do is by default these these sh files are not executable in Linux. You actually have to modify a flag on the file to make it uh, so that you can actually run it, or otherwise you're gonna get a permission denied error. Um, and so before we can actually make use of any of these things, we need to perform that operation. And it's, it's very simple. Uh, we do that with a command called chmod. And then to that, we're gonna pass plus x, which is basically saying uh, we want to turn on um, or make this a executable file and then we just pass the name of the file so in this case it's buildall.sh okay and that's all there is to it so we need to do that for um, buildall.sh and then we need to do that for engine build sh and testbed build sh and once you've done that then we should be ready to go. The next thing I wanted to point out real quickly before we attempt to build is in our task JSON, if you recall, uh, we actually have the build engine, build testbed, and build everything. And before in Windows, we were calling build all.bat. Here in Linux, we've already done the hard work. We've actually set up um, a call to build all.sh and build sh for the test bed as well as the engine. So um, when we go ahead and build, it's just gonna handle all that for us right out of the gate. The other thing that I wanna point out is in CPP properties, our Linux configuration here points to where our compiler path is, which if you installed Clang using the default options, it's, just, it's gonna be the USR bin Clang directory, uh, but otherwise everything else is pretty much the same. And then in our launch JSON, we have a Linux launch, which looks almost exactly like uh, the one for Windows, except instead of pointing to testbed exe, it's pointing to testbed. Instead of CPP VS debug, we are using CPP debug, which uses D GDB under the hood. Uh, and then our working directory is the same. Uh, we do not have this new external window option available for us on Linux. So it's actually gonna spit out to this terminal down here below, which is fine. Um, and that is pretty much it. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control Shift B. And when I do, we see that we get the output here that it built the engine and then it built the test bed and it was able to build both those things successfully. So when I look at this newly created bin folder here, we see that we have libengine.so, which uh, it puts this 
Uh, on Linux, you need this lib in front of things in order to be able to, to actually link with it properly. So it's created our shared object, which is the equivalent of our DLL and Windows, and then testbed, which is the equivalent of our executable on Windows. And so now that those things are built, I can press F5. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So it's actually saying we can't find the CPP VSD bug. And that is because I forgot uh, in the debug tab here uh, that I need to change this from Windows to Linux. You only have to do that once, but it's something that's easily, uh, easily forgotten. So if I run this, you'll see here that it says just process exited normally because I didn't actually set any breakpoints. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is let me go to main.c and I'll set a breakpoint uh, here just like we did on the Windows side and press F5 again and you can see that we have broken on this method right and so we can step into this by pressing F11 just like in Windows and when we do we see that we have uh, 42 that's passed through and then we have a printf command here so I'll go ahead and step over that and then um, exit the program now one thing I should point out um, on Linux that works a little bit differently is the terminal doesn't always flush right away um, unless you actually send a new line character. So I'm actually going to edit our test C a little bit and I'm going to put a backslash N here at the end so that we can actually see this string print out because otherwise it waits for one of those before the terminal actually, um, actually updates. So I'm going to build and run and step into and step over and now we see that the number is 42. And if I just continue the execution of the application, uh, it goes ahead and finishes out. It says it's done. Okay, so that is pretty much all we need to do to get this to run on Linux. So now um, anybody that's following this project can follow along on Windows or Linux. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up some low level things that are platform agnostic. And so with that, thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing. Click the little bell there for notifications on when new videos in this series or other series drop. And I will see you guys in the next video.